The passage of scripture that I want to turn to here um, is referred to as the love chapter. Does anyone know what the love chapter is? First Corinthians what? First Corinthians 13. Let's turn there. You know it's been said that if it's in the Bible, say three times, two or, le or three times especially, that it's something that's very important and we need to listen up and pay attention to it, right? Well, what about if it's in there 300 times or 400 times or even more? How much more important is it then? You know, um, I did some research and I found that just the word love is mentioned in the Old Testament about 130 times and in the New Testament almost 200 times and that does not include all the other derivatives like loveth and loved those things those words because if we calculated all those in we would probably be well over a thousand if not even more than that so what do you think do you think that this this topic of love is very very important yes or no it's extremely important amen so let's look here at 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians and chapter um, 13, and 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, and we're going to go ahead and read the entire chapter. Now, I want to I say before we begin that in this chapter, in the King James Version, they use the word charity, and the reason for that is because um, much like today in, believe it or not, back in even the 1600s, um, the word love was kind of um, adulterated. And so they wanted to make sure that, that no taint of that would be in this passage of Scripture. So they, they used the word charity, but actually there's three different words in the Greek for uh, love and this is the feast of love. It's the highest. This the word in um, in the Greek is agape love. So it is the feast of love. It is the deepest, most um, endearing form of love that there is in all of Scripture. So with that in mind, I'm going to whenever we say charity, wherever it says charity, I'm going to use the word love instead. I hope that's okay. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not love, I, ha I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not love, it profiteth me nothing. Love suffereth long and is kind. Love and envieth not. Love vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemingly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinking, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth, rejoiceth in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hope, all, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Love never faileth. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether they be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know, even as, I, as also I am known. And now abideth faith, hope, love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. Love is the one thing for sure that's going to go throughout all of eternity. Amen? Well, let's shift gears a little bit and let's discuss the depression that we see so much in our society today. It's very interesting, you know, um, I've, I've experienced depression myself and I know it's a very big 
large epidemic in our world today. And so I didn't want to just skip over this. I wanted to talk, to, talk about this just a little bit. Um, I had a friend stop by, and this was a little while ago, and he was expressing to me that he had fallen into a deep depression. And it had gone on for quite some time. And he got to thinking about uh, what could be the resolution to this issue? Because who wants to be depressed? It's miserable. It's a terrible experience to have to live in that condition. And finally, it dawned on him, for whatever reason, it dawned on him, you know what? The Bible is the Word of God, supposed to be the Word of God. And God, we hear all the time, Jesus loves you, right? Jesus loves you. So if he really loves me, then maybe the answer to my issues, to the, the answer to my condition here is possibly in the Bible. So you know what my friend did? He decided to pull out his Bible and start reading it and put God to the test. And sure enough, as he was reading the Word of God and praying, this depression vanished. It went away. That is the answer. We think so much of going to uh, some other uh, means of getting a re resolution to these issues. But really and truly, you can find it in the Word of God. I believe that very much. After all, who is the thief? The thief, John 10.10, 10, the thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Now, Satan loves to get us down. He loves to get us down. And typically what I see as what happens to me when I get down is it's because I'm looking inwardly. I'm picking myself apart. I'm finding fault with myself. And the other flip side of the coin is, this is the thing that Satan really likes to do too, is to puff us up. Get us to become selfish and arrogant. You see what I'm saying? Satan loves either side of that uh, equation is perfectly great with him because ultimately what he wants to do is to turn us from our Savior, keep us from looking up when we really should be looking up. You see, Jesus said, I am come that they might have life and that they may have it more abundantly. That's what the Lord wants. But Satan wants to steal. He wants to steal our peace. He wants to steal our faith. He wants to steal our love, etc., etc. And after all, did he not steal at least a third of the angels from heaven? Perfect beings. But yet he was able to steal them out of heaven. Look at this quote, uh, or this, this verse rather. 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Did you catch that? You see that? You see, God is actually giving us a warning, is he not? He's saying, be sober, be vigilant, because Satan is looking for whoever he can take advantage of in any way he can take advantage of them. Watch out. You know, who is, you know, people like to criticize the faithful ones that stand up and warn and give messages of warning. And we can see clearly that in, um, for instance, Matthew chapter 24, four times Jesus, when asked from the disciples, what's going to be the sign of your coming, what did he do? Four times he warned them about deceptions, deceptions, and false Christ. We must keep our eyes on Jesus because Satan wants us to look inwardly. He wants us to pick ourselves apart to the point that we are zero or even better, puffing ourselves up, filling us with pride and haughtiness and arrogance until we are totally worthless to the cause of Christ and worthless in any respect, really ultimately in the world. Satan, you see, is doing everything he can to completely annihilate our very existence. You see, we were made in the likeness of who? You think 
Satan loves that, that we're made in God's likeness. He hates that. And now if you're a professed Christian and you're following God's will and his way, don't you think he hates us even more? I believe he does. I mean, after all, look at what it says here. The verse says, devour, devour. Do you realize the magnitude of that? He wants to utterly destroy us. And you may be thinking, well, you're being kind of extreme here, Roy. But no, the word is devour. He wants to end our very existence. He would love more than anything to do that. Satan is absolutely, positively, you can guarantee one thing, he does not sleep. He is constantly looking for ways in which he can deceive us and destroy us. I stopped by and talked to uh, another friend a little while ago, and um, he was sharing an experience, or actually, he was, he was actually very distraught. He was um, quite tore up. He had tears in his eyes. He had just found out that one of his good friends, who was actually his insurance agent, that um, she had allowed a certain situation to trouble her so much it bothered her so extremely bad that she ended up actually picking up a gun and taking her own life. The really fascinating and interesting part is that, and very sad at the same time, is that right after she took her own life, the problem was resolved. God, uh, Satan held her in that state of depression just long enough that she saw no other way out, not knowing that God in his mercy was working things out if she had held on a little bit longer and she took her own life. Depression is a serious thing. You know, I, I like the story that uh, Doug Batchelor shares about his mother. His mother was uh, uh, a, a writer. I think she also did some acting as well. She was very famous. And um, she called him up and she was uh, relaying to Doug that she was very depressed and that she was considering taking her own life. And he talked with her and pleaded with her and, and um, finally he said, you know, Mom, death is a permanent thing. If you take your own life, that's a permanent action that you take. If you can just put that decision off as long as possible, every day just continue to put that into the future and don't take that action, don't take that spurious course and see where God leads. She did not ever take her life. The best definition of love we find in two verses, I think. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And then John 15, 13, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. And Jesus goes on to say, You are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. That is the greatest love. That comes from a Savior with a, the biggest heart overflowing with love you could ever imagine. You know, Satan likes to, likes to drop that little word in or that little uh, thought in our minds, doesn't he? Anyone else had that thought that, oh no, I've gone too far. There's no hope for me. There's no turning back. There's no resolution to the situation. I'm too far gone. Satan loves that. Well, I want to look at another passage of Scripture. Let's read Romans 8 and verses 31 through 39. Romans, the 8th chapter.
Romans, the eighth chapter. This is such a powerful passage of Scripture. I just absolutely love it. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for, my, for thy sake we are killed all the day long, we are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Powerful. That's how much God loves us. And to think that we've gone too far? No, no, no. We have not gone too far as long as probation hasn't closed and we haven't breathed our last breath. I have two questions for you. One, if God loves us this much, should we ever allow Satan to get us down or to puff us up? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. And the second question, what in turn should we do with this gracious and merciful love? Should we just keep and hoard the love to ourselves and sit on it? What should we do? We should share, share, share the love of God. Well, who is love? We read this, of course, uh, for our opening scripture. 1 John 4, 7, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is? God is love. Remember that. God is love. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to do what? Love one another. We should need to love one another. And what did I say earlier about you know, messages of warning are messages of love, okay? If we see somebody in harm's way, and that can be in spiritual harm's way or physical harm's way or uh, probably a number of different ones, we should love them enough to warn them that they're going down the wrong road. Amen. You know, over and over in the New Testament, we see the phrase repeated, love one another, love one another. And it's mostly found in the books of John. Have you noticed that? They're found mostly in the books of John. I find that fascinating. I truly find that fascinating. Why would I find that fascinating? Well, let's just look at this here. The disciple whom Jesus loved, John 13, 23, now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples, whom Jesus loved. Now who is re he referring to? He's referring to himself. He's the author of the book, right? So he's referring to himself as the one that Jesus loved. Now, do you think that that's arrogance there? What is the character of John that he would say such, such an audacious thing? I don't, I, don't, I don't really, I mean, is he saying that Jesus somehow loved him far more than he loved the rest of the disciples? What is he really saying? Is this, is this some form of arrogance or haughtiness? Well, did you know that actually five other times in the script, or four other times in the scripture, five total in his book, John, the book of John, um, we see him again say that, uh, refer to himself that way. Um, 
Then she runneth and cometh to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and saith unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher, and we knoweth not where they have laid him. John 21, 7, Therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved saith unto Peter, It is the Lord. And verse uh, 20, um, chapter 21 and verse 20, Then Peter turning about seeth the disciple whom Jesus loved following, which also leaned on his breast at supper, and said, Lord, which is he that betrayeth thee? You see a very loving picture of, of John, don't we? A very loving picture of John. Well, the reason that I find these, and there's one other, but I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. The reason I find this so fascinating is because the other Gospels don't paint John in that light. It's interesting, there's several uh, situations that happened that transpired that John just, just, just leaves out for some reason. Let's take a look at them, see what you think. Well, Jesus, before that, let's look at this. Jesus in Mark 3, 17, he said of James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, and he surnamed them Boanerges, which is the sons of thunder. Now look at that picture. Does, sun, does thunder sound like a good thing? When I see that kind of sky coming on the horizon, uh, it's kind of like duck and run, right? Hold, hold on to whatever you can hold on to because there might be some very tempestuous times ahead. He's referring to him as one of the sons of thunder. Very interesting. There has to be some, Jesus doesn't do anything without a reason. There has to be a reason for that, right? Well, let's look here. It's found in the book of Mark, not in John's gospel. And John answered him saying, Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name, and he followeth not us, and we forbade him because he followeth not us. But Jesus said, uh, said forbid him not, for there is is no man which shall do a miracle in my name that can lightly speak evil of me. For he that is not against us is on our part. What, what happened here? What, what actually transpired here? Let me just kind of try to set the stage a little bit and, and from my studies of this and my uh, comprehension of what happened. Okay, so James and John, they, they went around and they found this evangelist let's say he's an evangelist he's preaching the word of God he's doing great things he's preaching about Jesus he's bringing people to Christ they're like we don't know this guy uh -uh, he's not getting he's not a usurping power over us and and position over us he's not one of us we need to get rid of this guy and shut him up so they tell him to pack his stuff and get out of town right Can you hear the thunder? Can you hear the thunder? Jealousy. Jealousy. Jealousy in the heart of the disciple whom Jesus loved. Interesting. Well, let's look at this one again in another gospel, Luke 9, 51. And it came to pass when the time was come that he should be received up. Okay, so Jesus is about to end up going to the cross here it's very close he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem and sent messengers before his face and they went and entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him and they did not receive him because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem he wasn't going to stay long enough for them to waste their time housing they were going to wait for somebody that could, would stay a little longer so this was very offensive to these disciples so they said to Jesus, and when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, even as Elias did? Wow. Strong. But he turned and rebuked them and said, Ye know not what manner of spirit ye are of. What manner of spirit were they of? Satan. Satan's spirit. For the Son of Man has not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them, and they went to another village. 
part of what was going on here was actually racialism. Did you know that Samaritans were looked down on severely by the Jews? They were a heathen race and to the point, if a Jew saw a Samaritan coming down the street, they were to cross to the other side so as not to get anywhere close to those people. If they were sitting at a table eating food and the shadow of a Samaritan came across that food, they were to throw it upside down and refuse to eat it. It was no good. Extreme racism in the heart of the disciple whom Jesus loved. Can you hear the thunder? Can you hear the thunder? Step on everyone else to make it to the top. Matthew 20 uh, and verse 20, Then came to him the mother of Zebedee's children with her sons worshiping him and desiring a certain thing from him. And he said unto her, What wilt thou? She said unto him, Grant that these two my sons may sit, the one on thy right hand and the other on, thy, on the left, in thy kingdom. But Jesus answered and said, Ye know not what ye, are, what ye ask. Are ye able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of, and to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And look at this. James and John said, They say unto him, We are able. They're cohorts. They're working together. You know who this actually is? That's Salome. And do you know Salome was Mary's sister? So these two young men were actually Jesus' cousin, cousins, okay? So let me just broaden the scope here a little bit, if I may. Obviously, they're in it together. They knew, they knew that she was about to ask. Based upon what else we know about the son of Thunder John, we can only imagine that they probably pulled Salome aside and said, you know, we can feel it in the air. Jesus is about to set up his kingdom and we want to be on his right hand and on his left. But you know, it would, it would just not look so good if we ask him ourselves. So would you be so kind as to go to Jesus yourself and ask him for us? Is that? brotherly love? Stepping on whoever you can to make it to the top? Jesus said you don't understand what you're, what you're really asking. Are you able to be baptized in the baptism I'm about to be baptized with? Because there are going to be one on my left and on my right, but they're going to have nails in their hands and in their feet. Amen. Is that really where you want to be? Doing everything to get to the top, arrogant and haughty. This, this, the heart of the disciple whom Jesus loved. I ask you again, can you hear the thunder? Can you hear the thunder? A transformation did take place, however. John 19, 26, when Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by, whom he loved, this is the final, the fifth time that he refers to himself this way, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then saith he to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour that disciple took her into his own home and loved her and cared for her, for her and took care of her as though she were his own mother. At the foot of the cross, we finally see a true conversion experience in the heart, in the life of the disciple that Jesus loved. Oh, you know, those 
despised Samaritans that John once hated so much. We see him not too long after this actually baptizing hundreds of them. Hundreds of them. It's interesting that out of all the disciples, John was actually the only one that did not die a martyr's death. He did suffer. He was put into a huge vat of boiling oil for his faith because he would continue to go around and preach the gospel, preach the love of Jesus Christ everywhere he went, and they couldn't shut him up. They could not silence him. We see here in Acts of the Apostles, page 569, John was accordingly summoned to Rome to be tried for his faith. Here before the authorities, the apostles' doctrines were misstated. Do we see any of that today? Words being twisted? False witnesses accused him of teaching seditious heresies. By these accusations, his enemies hoped to bring about the disciples' death. The next page, 570, John was cast into a cauldron of boiling oil, but the Lord preserved the life of his faithful servant, even as he preserved the three Hebrews in the fiery furnace. As the words were spoken, thus perish all who believe in that deceiver, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, John declared, my master patiently submitted to all that, that Satan and his angels could devise to humiliate and torture him. He gave his life to save the world. I am honored in being permitted to suffer for his sake. I am a weak, sinful man. Christ was holy, harmless, undefiled. He did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. You just imagine the scene. It has been said that when they went to put John in this hot boiling vat of oil, they strung him up around his arms and hung him through the rope over the tree above it and hung him from this, uh, over this uh, boiling vat of oil. With the smoke and the stench coming up, his feet being scorched by it, they would ask him, will you recant? Will you deny your Savior now? He said, no, I can't. He loved me too much. They would dip him down a little bit further up to his ankles. Will you deny your Savior now? No, I can't. He loved me too much. They'd drop him down to his knees. They would ask him again, Will you deny Jesus Christ? No, I can't. He loved me too much. To his waist, up to his chest. they put him in that vat, bowling vat of oil, asking him again and again, Will you recant? No, I can't, because he loved me too much. True conversion. No matter how bad he was chided, he continued to repeat, no, I can't, because he loved me too much. Who is love? He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. Beloved, if God so loves us, we ought also to love one another. John was not puffed up and arrogant. I believe personally the reason why he didn't put those experiences in the gospel, his gospel, is because he was ashamed. John finally realized at the cross that no matter how bad he messed up, no matter what wrong he did, no matter how much he actually put Christ back up on that cross, Jesus would never stop loving him. That's why he says that he is the disciple whom Jesus loved because Jesus would not stop loving him no matter how wrong he was and how badly he erred. I want to tell you a story. There was uh, very famous for his day back in the early 1700s. 
an evangelist by the name of John B. Garth. He was the, the best America had produced when it comes to preachers and evangelists. He literally won hundreds and thousands of people to Christ through his work. Well, there was a situation going on in a town that he was about to visit and do a series. He was unaware of the situation. But here is the situation. There was a young lad, late teens, maybe early 20s, who just continued to embarrass his parents. He had a terrible drinking problem. He was just addicted to alcohol. And he would go out into town and he would do things that would, that would just absolutely humiliate and just embarrass his parents, especially his father. Well, his father had had enough of it. And one night when he came staggering up the walkway and he saw him, he had his bags out on the porch. His mother was right there as well. Little gray-haired, stoop-shouldered mother. And when this lad comes stumbling up the walkway, he said, because you have done something so bad this time. You have embarrassed me beyond reproof. I've had enough. You're out. You're out of here. You're out of my life. You're no longer my son. The mother pleaded with the father. She said, no, please. Where is he going to go? Where is he going to stay? Where is he going to live? What's he going to do? I don't care, the father said. He's done it this time. This is it. I'm done with him. You're out of my life. I'm finished. That little stoop-shouldered, gray-haired mother pleaded with the father one more time. She said, please, please, can I at least clean out the old chicken coop out back? He'll have a roof over his head. He'll have a, clean, or he'll have a place to, to rest anyway. Would that be okay? Maybe then, you know, he'll, he'll be, he, he won't be in our household anymore. Well, the father consented to that plea from that dear, stooped, shouldered, gray-haired mother. Well, she went in there and she whitewashed the walls. She cleaned up a chicken coop as best as you can clean up a chicken coop. Put a little cot in there, threw him a rug on the ground, you know, gave him a little lamp. And whenever he would go out and get drunk, she would, she would put him in there and put the latch over, you know, the big bar that would go over the door so he couldn't get out and embarrass his father when he'd get a hold of some liquor. Well, this went on, and finally she heard the great news that this wonderful evangelist, John B. Garth, was coming to town. She'd done some research on him and found out that he, at one point, had also had a drinking problem. She thought, this is my chance. She went to those meetings. She sat on the front row. She took in everything about the message that she could take in, and it was a beautiful, Christ-centered, moving message. And at the end of the message, she, she was the first one to want to talk with him. She said, dear brother, dear pastor, will you please, I understand that you once had a drinking problem. You had an, a problem with alcohol. My son, he has a terrible problem with alcohol. Will you please come and talk with him? And please, if, if at all possible, please help him. Well, the evangelist was very much obliged to help. So he followed her home, lockstep every turn, and he thought it rather strange when they were walking in the front gate there and going to the home that she detoured and went around and went to the back of the house. And there you could see the light glowing through this little chicken coop. She said, he's in there. I'll just wait inside and pray. So the pastor went over and 
remove the bar off of the door. Didn't really know what to say or how to approach. The man was, the young lad was obviously wasted. Had a bottle in his hand. And he said, son, do you believe in God? He said, no, I don't believe in your blankety blank God, explicitive deleted. He said, son, do you believe in Jesus? No, I don't believe in your blankety blank Jesus. And after the outburst and the, the insults and the humiliation that he, he felt from this young lad coming back at him, the, the fierce anger and hatred that was in the, the poor lad's heart, he turned around and he said, I'm done. I can't do anything else here. This is, this is irreparable. This is, we can't fix this. And he walks out the door and he slams the bar back over and he's heading for the street. And he happened to glance up. In the second story window of that house, and in that window, he saw a little stooped shoulder, gray haired mother, praying with tears flowing down her cheeks. And he was so moved by that scene. He was like, All right, Lord. He felt the Holy Spirit speaking to his heart, and he said, All right, Lord, I'm going to give it one more try but you gotta help me, Lord. And he turned around and he flung that thing off and he opened that door and he said, son, do you believe in God? He said, no, I don't believe in your blankety blank God. He said, son, do you believe in Jesus? No, I don't believe in your blankety blank Jesus. He said, son, do you believe in love? There was silence. The boy didn't have a fast response for that. And as he contemplated what the pastor had just said, the wheels began to turn, and he remembered seeing images of that sweet, gray-haired, stoop-shouldered mother caring for him, defending him when his father was ready to throw him out on the street, preparing him this little place, bathing him when he couldn't bathe himself, cleaning, himself, cleaning him when he couldn't clean himself, and these images of his dear, sweet, stooped shoulder, gray haired mother kept replaying in his mind in this alcohol soaked brain. He had no choice but to confess yes, I believe in love. The pastor wasted no time, he fell to his knees. And he said, oh, love, come into this room. The boy interrupted. He said, what are you talking about? What are you praying to? What is this love that you're praying to? He said, son, God is love. I'm praying to love. He threw that bottle down on the floor and he joined the pastor on his knees beside that bed. And in an ever widening pool of alcohol, he prayed, love, please come into my heart. Love, please heal my heart. Love, please save me. He got the victory that day over that terrible addiction to alcohol. Well, as we know, John survived that boiling vat of oil. I think it's interesting, he was the only disciple that we see at the foot of the cross. And he's the only disciple that we see living a full life. All the other disciples died a martyr's death. John would go and preach or actually, in, when he was up in his 90s, he would go to his church there in Ephesus. And he was a little bit, you know, showing the signs of age. And uh, he would, they would bring him in and set him right up front. And one week, maybe young Timothy would be preaching, and he would preach a beautiful message about the love of, of God and the love of Christ and... Um, some prophecy 
And at the end of the service, he, turn, he would turn to the Apostle John and say, Brother, have you heard a word from the Lord? Have you heard a word from Jesus? John would feebly stand up, turn, and face the congregation, and he would say, yes, yes, I have. He said, Jesus told me to tell you to love one another. The next week, maybe it would be young Titus preaching the message, and, and uh, once again, they would have Brother John come up and be sitting on the front row, and after a beautiful message, they would turn to Brother John and say, Brother John, is there a word from our Lord Jesus Christ? He would feebly push himself up, turn, face the congregation, and say, yes, yes, there is. Jesus told me to tell you to love one another. Week in and week out, it was always the same. Every time he would stand up and say, yes, there is a word from our Lord. He told me to tell you to love one another. Just love one another. Please remember, no matter what I preach this year, no, what, no matter what other messages you hear this year, please always remember that love is the greatest. Love never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether they be knowledge, it shall vanish away. And now abideth faith, hope, love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. Jesus told me to tell you to love one another. Amen. Amen.